What's up, gang? It's Wes. Welcome to Ask Wes, episode number four. This is the uh, Q&A show. So basically, you send in questions, and then I hopefully give something resembling an answer. And it's a lot of fun. This one's going to be a lot of fun. We have 12 questions lined up, and it's a very wide range of questions as well. And in fact, in this episode, we might even take a look at a special skill that I have that we've never seen on the channel before. Hmm, what could it be? But uh, yeah, but let's just go ahead. Let's get started. I'm excited about these. So yeah, uh, let's dig in. Let's uh, answer some of these questions. All right, man, we are here. We are here. I'm excited for this one. Um, we haven't done an Ask Wes episode in a long time. And yeah, like I said, in the kind of pre-roll thing, send in your questions, you know, at any time, leave comments on any of my videos. I actually look through every single comment that I get. Uh, you can also send them on social medias, uh, all that stuff, Patreon, the Discord, wherever you want to reach out. And if you have questions to ask, I'm more than happy to answer them. So it's funny, this episode... Um, it's all kind of from one person. So our good friend Voidstead, a uh, fan of the channel for quite a while now, uh, thank you for all of these questions. They're amazing. So we have 12 questions, but the, the range is so big, I feel comfortable just taking the Voidstead questions as like one big episode. So we're going to cover a lot. We're going to cover art fundamental stuff, some special skills, um, yeah, some, some really cool ones. And I'm excited if you guys have answers to these as well. Leave them in the comments. I would like to know, especially a few of these. A few of these, I think, are going to be uh, prime candidates for some good discussions in the comments below. But before we get too far into this, I do want to apologize about the kind of sporadic nature of the videos lately. Because right now, my beautiful, lovely youngest daughter, Evelyn, is going through a sleep regression. Uh, so it's a lot of, a lot of, you know, 10 PM to 2:30 AM wake up window type stuff, as you can see right here. <laughs> and it is, it is great. It's adorable. Um, she's very interested in everything. So like she'll reach over to the microphone, she'll reach over to the computer lights and stuff. And we'll go like into the darker room where there's no lights on and she'll still just ba 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 ba. It's hilarious and adorable, but daddy is very tired. And yeah, so, uh, whenever she kind of gets through this developmental phase, uh, I think the videos are going to come more like once a week or so. Uh, cause yeah, for the past few videos, it's been like a month between videos. And I don't like doing that, even though YouTube is definitely not the way I make money at all. Like, trust me, don't get into YouTube for the money making. Um, I, I do want to be more consistent with it because I think it's a lot of fun. I love talking to you guys. And part of that is getting these questions. So we have 12 here. Let me go into them. I'll just go right away. Um, so Voidstead does say, hello, I've watched more of your videos and I love them. I want to ask a few questions for Ask Wes. Um, they also say, sorry for this bombardment of wording, grammar, English is not my native language, and I'm curious about some of these things. It's great, and your English is fantastic. So I'm going to show each question up on the screen, and then I'm going to extrapolate a little bit, um, and then we'll get to those, those deals. So let's go into number one. I like to watch the stories of becoming a professional artist from scratch. I'd like to see one from you as well. That's a cool idea. That's a cool idea for video. So if you watch the uh, Star Wars video where I talk about some of my background with Star Wars before getting hired, uh, yeah, that was a fun one to make. It was fun kind of going through old memory lane, looking for pictures, looking for things like that, just to kind of get that nostalgia trip that I really went on as working on the project. Um, so maybe I can, I might get in touch with like my parents and see if they have any old like camera stuff. Because I used to do art competitions in like high school, even though we didn't have an art program, I was sent off to regionals and I think I placed like fifth or something. It was a still life deal. And I did that twice um, and got in the top 10 each time, which is cool, especially with no like quote unquote formal high school training. 
then I went on to college and actually got atelier training and stuff like that and kind of refined the skill set. So we can dig into that. I think that's a fun idea. It might take a little bit to put together, but I think it'd be worth it because those are a lot of fun. I like seeing those too. And like, here's little kid drawings and here's like, oh, if I were to redraw the same thing now. So a lot of fun stuff there. And uh, I know I'm a big fan of Tyler Jacobson and I have his art book, uh, The Art of Tyler Jacobson. And he does that in the book. He shows, hey, here's some like third grade pictures that I drew with crayons and stuff. It's really neat. So, yeah, we'll we'll dig in. We'll, we'll see what we can do with that. one. So question number two, how is it possible that people admire artists and praise them for being talented and say they themselves will never be at, um, maybe at the level of those that they like? But on the other hand, people refuse to pay for the artist's work and they wish that AI would replace them. Uh, so they get like masterpieces for free or, you know, art in the style of somebody. Um, and they'll say stuff like, it's just pictures, right? Um, and I think art is not a true career path uh, is in this category. So yeah, a lot of the same people that would use AI to replace artists and like all that, they don't think it's a valuable skill for, um, I don't know, society, which is the most backwards thing in the world. And it's funny because these same people used to say stuff like, hey, learn to code, learn to code uh, computers. Well, I know three programming languages and a fourth I'm OK at, but I need a lot of kind of guidance on it. Um, and these are like C Sharp and Python. And, you know, I've done front and back end web development. I've done server maintenance. I have done um, access database, which isn't programming, but it can be. That stuff gets crazy. Um, but I've done data analysis. I've done actual generative training. Uh, back in my old job and uh, did it for higher education and college level and did it for the state and all this other stuff. So I love it when those other artists are like, hey, get a real job, learn how to code. I say, I can code better than you in my sleep, um, <laughs> which is true. Uh, so I always love those. Those are those are fun. And then you can always remind those people. Anything you have, whether it's T-shirts or movies or, you know, I always say, watch the credits, anything that they're interested in. And a lot of these people ironically have like anime profile pictures and stuff. Like, who do you think made that? Like a person, an artist made that stuff. Like everything you have packaging for like the t-shirts you buy and like the design of the vehicle you drive and even city planning. I know city planners and architecture students that are incredible with being able to take ideas and take these kind of complicated, I mean, you know, if you have millions of people and you need to make sure that traffic runs smooth and stuff, that's an art. I fully believe 1000%, and this is after doing, you know, sales and retail, also doing technology, working in that sector. Art is a blue collar job. And being an illustrator, being an artist is the same thing as being a plumber. It is the same thing as being a mechanic. It is the same thing as being a doctor, as being a dentist. You are there either to enrich people's lives or take care of people so they can enrich people's lives. Do you know what I'm saying? Like whenever you're adding to society, that's something you're doing. You're either taking care of the population uh, like physically or you're taking care of the population mentally and spiritually. That's where art comes in. Um, my wife is a math teacher and, you know, she's way smarter than I'll ever be. And we always talk about that. We think a lot of this weird, well, technology's the answer, bro. And like all this kind of tech bro nonsense, reinventing the wheel, whatever you want to call it uh, for no good reason is actually because the arts are being defunded in schools. And STEM is being higher funded. People are thinking STEM is more important while the arts are less important. But less kids nowadays know how to paint, know how to draw, know how to write, know how to sing, know how to play an instrument. The culture of being a human being, the act of creation is sadly going bye bye. And it is what it is. People get so caught up in trying to make millions and make money and oh, investor capital and all this other crap that they don't see that that's not what being alive is about. Being alive is about spreading joy. That's it. Be nice to each other, man. 
So yeah, long-winded answer, but a great question. Don't give any credence to the people that think artists deserve not to have a wage or whatever. I guarantee those people have really dull lives. They're very boring. You would be bored to tears if you would talk to them like in an actual setting. But the thing is, they probably don't have social skills anyway, uh, you know, as seeing as they want uh, computers to take over everything. So, yeah, I'll go program my computers, make computer games, know how to draw, have these big skill sets, and they can cry and complain when they still use all these cheating mechanisms and still can't get a job. Sucks to be you, nerd. All right. Number three, I've watched your video about the gauntlet method. And it was kind of funny for me because primarily I learn in a traditional environment with traditional paints and things like that. So doing everything in one layer is more natural for me. And whenever I watch somebody work with so many layers, I start to panic. <laughs> this is hard mode for me. Do you have some tutorials or advice on working in layers with ease? So I'm with you. The more layers on something, the more I start to freak out. And really my advice, and you'll see it if you watch really any of the videos over the past few years where it shows my work process, you'll notice that I keep a sketch layer with a multiply blending mode. That way it's always darker than what's underneath it. I do my sketch layer, then I'd put in values. So I work just in black and white. Then I uh, have that layer, and then on top of the layer, I either do like overlay blending mode or a color blending mode and splash in what I consider a, a wash of colors. I use colors on that. That way it doesn't affect the values. I can kind of see it better. Then what I do whenever I have all of that stuff kind of figured out and where I want it and I'm ready to push to that next level, I literally compress all of my layers. I merge them all together and then I paint on top of that. It's much like the underpainting method that you would do, um, saying if you're going to be doing like a blue sky or something, the underpainting method in traditional art, you would use warm colors to like block out your values and then paint your cooler colors on top of that, kind of giving yourself a map on where you want things. And that's totally, that's exactly what I do when I do use layers. But I'm like you, the more layers, the more anxiety I get because I'm like, oh, what if I'm on the wrong layer? What a, you know, I'm, I'm so worried about the manipulation of the structure of the painting that I'm not painting. I'm like, what layer am I on? Oh, let me click there and let me drag this and let me group this and let me blah, blah, blah. Like at that point, I might as well just play Starcraft or something because I'm like controlling things. And But no, if I want to paint, I want to paint. So I structure that with a sketch on top, my color splash right here, and then my values at the bottom. Then I press them all together, one layer, and then I work from there. So hopefully that helps. But yeah, I if you haven't seen the Gauntlet Method video, check that one out. I think if you come from a traditional background where you're just used to working on a canvas or watercolor or kind of whatever, that might help you integrate a little easier into digital. And what's nice is the way you work digitally with one layer can also help your traditional work. So we talk all about it in the video. Highly recommend it. A lot of people seem to love it. So question number four, I'm only two years into the fundamental drill stage and my dexterity is really bad. Ooh, interesting. This is a topic I've wanted to talk about for a while. Do you think it's useful to spend 30 to 60 minutes per day to draw straight lines and circles? And is it possible to achieve a state where you can draw perfect lines and circles on a pen tablet or um, are you like bound to use the digital tools, the autocorrect or the ellipses or whatever? This is a, this could be a whole video by itself. So dexterity is such a huge component of art, knowing what mark you want to make and where you want to make it and have those two things be true. I put my line here as opposed to here. Like that sounds really silly, but like how you hold your pencil very much determines how you write or how you draw or it's a big deal. Um, and a lot of people don't ever talk about it, but I think dexterity is one of the biggest learning curves. There is a website called, oh God, what is it? Is it drawabox.com? And it has this method to where literally you do your drills of drawing straight lines, drawing boxes and different perspectives and stuff. 
you will get extremely good at your dexterity and knowing where your lines are going to be and being able to start and stop them on a whim and they're going to be smoother and they're going to be more. So yes, that is very helpful. However, do I believe that you need to spend 30 to, you know, even 10 minutes a day doing that? No, I don't think you do. In my opinion, just my opinion, you will get better, more interesting results faster if you just do the thing you want to do anyway. The only way you're going to get better at drawing characters in interesting angles is by drawing characters in interesting angles. It sounds really obvious, and I don't mean it to be, you know, kind of like wishy-washy or whatever. It's just, if you do the thing, you're going to get better at the thing. Does that make sense? Like, your, your dexterity is going to improve anyway. The more that you do the task, the more that you do this, the better you will get at it. You can't help it. Your body will get conditioned. Um, I know during like fitness and stuff like that, people will always, they, they're so caught up on like, okay, what are my exercises? In what order do I do my exercises? I'm doing like upper body, then lower body, then my arms and my shoulders. and my. They get really caught up in that sort of thing. Where you really get your results is when you rest, when you go to sleep. There, there's been time and time again, studies prove If you're studying for a test, cramming doesn't work as well as doing little bits of studying consistently and then sleeping, literally sleeping, to make sure that that knowledge gets embedded into your brain. There's a a specific term for it, and I can't remember it right now, but in psychology, that is absolutely true. The human brain does better when you practice a thing and then sleep on it, and then you practice a thing and then you sleep on it. And you do that consistently, not even for a super long time each session, but just the consistency of doing it. It's the same thing as like with exercise or something called the 21 day fix. You make a habit in 21 days. That's the idea of this stuff, right? So if you just do it five minutes a day, you're going to get better. You can't help it. So the way I always frame it, you can either frame it in the way of no matter how much I do, I will always get better which is true, and you're because you're doing it, you are actively getting better. Or you can frame it the way I usually frame it. The worst I will ever be at art is right now. Right now, right this second, is the worst I will ever be for the rest of my life. If I pick up a pencil and make four marks, I'm already better than I was 10 seconds ago. Because I've experienced, I made those marks. It sounds hoity-toity or whatever, but like, I'm not a big proponent in drilling unless your task is to draw a box from nine different angles, which if you're in concept art, sometimes that's true. Don't worry about it. Don't, I mean, draw a box has great stuff and you might learn better that way. That's a whole different topic. How, How do you learn the best? How do you learn? Um, And the, the nice thing about boxes and lines is they're very easy to see results very quickly. So you're going to get that positive kind of dopamine hit of like, hey, I am getting better at this. It's like weight loss. It really is. You don't see the changes because you look at yourself in the mirror every day and you step on the scale or like with music and you're learning an instrument, you can kind of feel like you're getting better. But then if somebody sees you, you're like, oh, you're practicing. That's cool. That's cool. Or, oh, you've been working out. That's cool. And then they leave for a month and they come back. I guarantee they're going to be like, wow, you look fantastic. You're like, what? I didn't change anything. But you're changing. You just can't see it. Okay. So hang in there. The dexterity stuff is a huge topic. If you want me to go and do a bigger video about that, please let me know. Because I'm a firm believer in that. I think dexterity and actually how you hold brushes and where you stand and the angles you draw at, I think that has a lot to do with how your outcomes come out. So, so yeah, let me know in the comments if you want to see that one, but great question. So number five, as I started to draw better, I saw that there's so much bad art and so much good art. That's a start, but I don't know what to look for in good art yet. 
it just all looks cool and that's it for me. Um, do I have to look for something in particular or is just looking at it by itself enough? It's another great question. So I always bring up this graph and this graph shows there are two parts to your art learning journey. And this is actually for everything, for any kind of skill. You're going to have basically your dexterity. So kind of tie it into the other one. You're going to have your dexterity. How well can you do the task? And then your other one is your eyes. How well can you see the task? It's like if you are a musician, you could be pretty good, but you probably idolize like Miles Davis or John Batiste or, you know, Slash on guitar or whatever. Like you have your person because you can notice what they're doing. You know it. You're, you're at a level now to where you can see the nuances of how they hold the strings or blow the trumpet or whatever. Like you now have more information so you can better appreciate how just freaking good some of these people are. That's part of the growth process because then your dexterity, you're going to start learning from them and your dexterity starts to get better because you either start emulating them or you start learning lessons, really studying to try to get better. And what you're going to notice is your art starts to get better. You know, your thing starts to get better and you're like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever made, man, that I'm on fire now. I can't be stopped. Look at this. And then because your art and your dexterity are better, your eyes start to improve because you're used to looking at better stuff. Your stuff is better. Your taste is refining. You're going to where, you know, what interests you. And then that starts getting better than what your dexterity is. And that's when you run into a rut. Man, I'm trying everything. I feel like I'm getting worse at art. I feel like I'm not improving at all. I'm just in the slump. You're really not. You're still very much improving. Your eyes are just better now. And now your skill set is going to start climbing to meet your new eye skill set. It always changes. It always goes. That's how you can see people work from like a certain level up to like professional in a few years is they kind of master that ladder. And as you climb it, you realize what the process is. So I always say, if you're in an art slump, don't worry. That literally means you're about to slingshot your skill set. You're about to improve so much you won't even know what hit you. But if you're in this nice, oh man, man, things are going great, man. I'm Everything I'm drawing is working and it's looking good and I'm getting likes on Insta and, you know, I got all this stuff. Enjoy it. Very much enjoy it because you earned it. But know that now the study mind is going to start kicking in again. So I would say to kind of go back to the uh, the question at hand of saying like, hey, is it looking at it and hey, this art is cool. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's great. If you can notice a certain style or certain things that you really like the look of, number one, enjoy it because it's awesome. Like you get to enjoy it as a person and as an artist. But really ask yourself why. Why do I like this? I know I like it. Why do I like it? Um, good example for me. I love neoclassical metal, like Ingve Malmsteen, Joe Stump. I love that stuff. Love it, love it, love it. I wish I could play that stuff because it always catches my ear correctly. Like I, it, whenever I hear it, I'm like, man, that sounds good. It sounds like Bach, Beethoven, you know, Vivaldi, all this stuff. It just whatever happens in my brain brain meat. It just works, you know, <laughs> but then I started studying music theory. Okay. What are they doing? Oh, they're doing the, uh, you know, harmonic minor scale and they end phrases or, or ends of a uh, certain rhythm on like a major third, or they do a, a chromatic walk down during a turnaround. Or I start getting this kind of dictionary of terms and I can start noticing it more. And now I can do that stuff on guitar. Like, not well, but I know what it is and I can hear it and I'm like, oh, they did this. So whenever you're amazed by like musicians knowing stuff by ear, that's how they do it. They learn the pattern, they learn the method, and then you can apply it to everything. And visual art is exactly the same way. If you really love Caravaggio, 
because of how he does his uh, chiaroscuro, how it goes from very, very dark in the background to like really blown out highlights. Practice that. Practice it. You're going to be amazed at how much you learn just from these small little nuances, you know. So, yeah, I would say you're on the right path. Just keep finding stuff that you like and you're always going to learn from it. Number six, we're about halfway done. I see so many people on Reddit speaking against Photoshop and they heavily promote Clip Studio Paint. I, I almost feel guilty about using Photoshop, but essentially you're just paying monthly for Photoshop and yearly for Clip Studio Paint. I don't see much difference in that. That's a great point. And if you want the updates or use it on mobile devices, you have to subscribe to it, uh, Clip Studio Paint anyway. And Canva just bought Affinity, which yes, they did. Um, I see them, I can see them introducing a subscription payment as well. So side note, they did come out and say that they're going to have a perpetual license always, but they probably will introduce a subscription thing. I, yeah, I, I can see that. So maybe Adobe isn't so bad after all. Did they just hop on the subscription bandwagon too early? <laughs> oh, Adobe. I hate subscription models. I hate them. I understand from a business perspective that you need some sort of revenue to continue development, which we're going to talk about that a little later with Krita, uh, development, but also server costs, what have you. Where I start having a problem with it is when you start having cancellation fees, hidden fees, um, <laughs> If you're using AI, hey, Adobe Firefly, um, you're you're barking up a lot of wrong trees. And to be totally fair, we're going into the, this goes into the whole economic thing. You know, everybody's raising prices across the board. Cost of living is kind of skyrocketing, especially depending on where you live. But raise, uh, you know, wages have not improved. Now you're... Now, even the thing that you have as a hobby, maybe now that's a subscription as well. Like what? Like there's another bill I have to have. I have to pay for lights and internet and a house and food and, you know, gas for the car and insurance and all this and all this. And now I have to pay a bill to be able to paint on a computer screen. Are you high? <laughs> like it's absurd, man. Um, I'm against it. I'm against it. I understand it from the business side. I don't like it. Anything that gives me a perpetuity license, if I buy it once, I can own it. Because I do see the difference in a subscription model and Clip Studio model. Because with Clip Studio, I could choose not to upgrade again. I could, I could jump off that rodeo whenever I wanted. I could just leave, right? but I still own the thing I bought. With subscription, you are dealing with a license. Do you have permission to use the thing? If I stop paying, I can't use it at all. That's where I have a problem with it. You are paying for access to use the thing that you should be able to use regardless. I actually have an old copy of Adobe Photoshop CS6 that I bought with my money Way back when, this was like, what, 2003, 2004 when this came out? I got it for college. I still have it. I have my Adobe book somewhere up here. It came in a book. It came in the thing. It was like a deal because it, we were taking a graphic design course, and it came with a copy of Photoshop CS6. So I have a copy of Photoshop I can always install and use. So I can, I can duck out of the subscription model whenever I want. So that's a nice feeling. But I would say I would much rather go the perpetual use, meaning you buy it one time and then you own it, rather than subscription stuff. I think, yeah, it is what it is. And all of everything is Netflix and, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many subscription services now that people are just used to it. I mean, you do it for phone apps. You do it for all sorts of stuff. But no, I like I like the idea of getting a thing and quote unquote owning it rather than having to lease out the, the privilege to be able to use a thing that I was going to use anyway. So, Oh, hey, future Wes here. 
So funnily enough, whenever I loaded up Adobe Photoshop 2024 last night to get to work on some non-disclosure agreement stuff I'm working on, it kept crashing over and over and over. And then whenever I updated Creative Cloud, I restarted the computer, did all that stuff, it kept bombarding me, bombarding me with its dumb generative AI, Firefly, Adobe stock, whatever crap. So I said, push comes to shove, and I generated my cancellation notice for Adobe. So you know how I talked about, you know, Adobe CS6, I think, was the one that I have a, a version of. Well, I have it reinstalled. So the next time you ever see me use Photoshop, it will be that version from like 2003 or so. But yeah, um, Adobe Creative Cloud can shove it. <laughs> Number seven. When you see a juicy painting in real life, <laughs> do you want to taste or eat that paint? Yeah. Yeah, I know you're not supposed to. Funnily enough, all the stuff that has the really nice thick brushwork, the really thick stuff, it, especially if you went to an art museum and you saw some old work and some like historic work and it had some nice impasto, like, ooh, just luxurious stuff. That's usually the paint that is very toxic for you. It's your lead paint, your real cadmiums, um, the stuff that like don't, doesn't work well with human beings. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I can't remember what that's called. But there's a certain thing. It's like butter. You look at it and you're like, hmm, that's some that's some delicious looking brush strokes right there. There's something about it. There's some brain numbing thing. I don't know what it is. It it, it is funny though. But really what I do, I like to go up and I like to look close and then stand back about the nine feet and be like, oh, genius. Like, how do they, like, especially a John Singer Sargent or Anders Zorn or something, you see those impressionistic brushstrokes. Like Richard Schmidt, of course, you see some of that stuff and you're like, man, I bet, I bet you could smother that paint on pancakes, man. I bet that is super thick. Um, <laughs> but yes, oddly enough, yeah. Um, number eight. I didn't see you using 3D. How do you manage to avoid it and make good construction for your works? So funny you mention that. I'm working on a Clip Studio um, video right now to talk about 3D models. And I might be working on a course about how to use 3D and do paintovers. Um, I always wanted to be able to make art on anything. Like if you had an ink pen and a napkin, I want to make something there at the table. If you give me 20 or 30 minutes, something that I could sell, you know what I mean? Like I wanted to be at the quality and uh, at the level that no matter where I am and no matter what I'm painting, it has to look good. It has to look believable um, no matter what I'm using or how I use it. So with 3d, 3D can get me some incredible like cinematic camera angles. And I do have a few pieces. In fact, I'll show one right here, uh, a few pieces that I did 3D and I kind of did paint overs and brushstroke smudges and stuff like that to really make it look more like a painting. Um, I should probably do it more because I could really grind out a whole bunch of paintings very quickly that way. But it's a different skill set. I would say it's closer to matte painting than it is like traditional painting. It will, it will help with my composition eye. It will help me kind of, yeah, get those good camera angles, so to speak. I don't know. Well, uh, we might be using it more, but th it's good. I think it's an incredible tool, especially Unreal Engine 5.0. You got Lumen, you got Nanite, you got like Quixel, uh, uh, yeah, Mega Quixel or whatever they call it, the, the bridge stuff where it's like realistic settings and it's unbelievable what you can get with that but sometimes that stuff looks so good i don't have to paint it you know it's like a good photograph if it's a good photo it may not make a good painting vice versa so there's a lot to that um that's a good point though like i should use 3d more just because i think it'd be fun and to learn how to animate in 3d and actually do like cool camera swings and dolly shots and stuff i think that'd be a lot of fun uh so who knows who knows what the future holds man so, number nine, I get a feeling that stylized things are harder to draw than real things. I look at anime art, and it's all based on realism, but stylized in a very smart way. 
With real things, well, you just draw it, but with stylized things, you have to know the real things, plus have some knowledge of, uh, in a design aspect about simplification, and that is harder. Is that true, or do I overthink things? That is absolutely 1,000% true. Stylized art, and still having it be impactful, in my opinion, is infinitely harder than working from life, it's infinitely harder from working from photo reference, um, still life, you know, a la prima, whatever you want to call it. Each has their own challenges for sure. But when you deal with realism or painting from life, there is right or wrong. Either that perspective is correct or it is not. Either those shapes are correct in proportion to one another based on what you're seeing or it is not. It's very easy to check your answers. You know what I mean? It's very easy to look and be like, yep, that looks, yeah, that's what, maybe that's a little darker. Maybe this is a little lighter. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe this, but it looks fairly decent. You have something to compare it to. Once you start stylizing, it's all up here. It's all based on taste. It's all based on the things you can't quite put words to. And when you start working in a purely visual sense, either it looks right or it doesn't based on a fictional reality, that's incredibly hard to do. That's that's the hardest thing to do. Um, I do recommend there is a James Gurney book um, called Imaginative Realism, and I highly recommend it because he talks about bridging the gap between literal reality and fictional imaginative reality. And it's great. Um, and ironically, the best way that he does it is he makes models. So whether, you know, nowadays it's at 3D, is that literal clay, um, to be able to make something from imagination and be able to re represent it and paint it, there's a balance there. And that's the hardest part about being a sci-fi and a fantasy artist. I'll just come out and say it. Uh, that's the hardest part of my job. The hardest part of my job is realizing these fictional things trying to bring them into a sense that people understand them, even if they're not fans of like nitty gritty sci-fi or high fantasy or whatever. Can they look at the image? Can it work? Can it tell the story? And how can I best do that without being so like strangled down by whatever reference I use? That's the hardest part of the job. No question in my mind. Um, if it was just, oh, I'm going to paint somebody's portrait. I'm going to paint, you know, this landscape that I'm, you know, standing out here. That's just a joy. I love doing that stuff. It's a lot of fun. That's how I was trained formally. So I'm super comfortable doing that. There's no stress. I just do it until it looks right. Fine. But whenever you start stylizing, now you have to start making decisions. The decisions are not made for you. You have to make those decisions and then you have to stand by them. That's a very hard thing to muster. It's a very hard thing to really embrace, especially if you're non-decisive or if you're too sporadic or, or kind of chaotic in the way you make your decisions. So yeah, I would say it's infinitely harder to do stylization. Number 10, whenever I see bad shading in anime art, I want to scream. <laughs> Shade a real sphere. It will help you tremendously. Why do people ignore the quote unquote boring stuff and jump straight into the end game? I think this may happen because people underestimate art jobs. It's not just pick up a pencil and draw a masterpiece. It's a job just like any other it requires you to study from scratch for many years to become decent. So even if you're a hobbyist, it doesn't change things or maybe they skip it because it's boring. I don't know. What do you think and feel when you look at bad beginner art that is obviously ignoring the fundamentals and ask for advice? So I have what I think is a fairly solid answer to this. The reason why people want to jump to the cool, sexy stuff, the cool angles, the race cars, the flying ships, the, you know, big battle scenes, the, all this other stuff is because that's the stuff that is inspiring them to learn art in the first place. It's like, if you were a big fan of basketball, you would not say, wow, man, I love basketball. I love watching NBA games. I love watching the professionals do it. If I go buy basketball shoes 
and pick up a basketball for the first time ever, maybe I'll make the NBA team. Like, you don't know how to hold the basketball. You know what I mean? Like, you don't even know how to dribble. You don't know how to run while holding a ball and trying to make, like, you can't cross over. You can't do any of that stuff. So why do you think that when you first get started, you're going to be able to hang at the pro level? So it's, it's a, it's a dichotomy. It's a, it's a weird false equivalence. People see the sexy stuff and then they try it. They realize that they need to learn those fundamentals first and either they just quit or they think, Hey, I can just ignore those really boring fundamentals and I'll just keep making character art. I'll just keep making whatever type of art. And that's fine. If you're, if you're a weekend warrior, if you're looking just as a thing to kind of do some improvement, you have some cool sketches, you want to fill up a sketchbook, you just, you find it relaxing. The sky is the limit. Do whatever you want. I'm not here to be art police. You know what I mean? Just do it. If you find joy in it, do it. Period. But you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore the building blocks. You can't. People don't see the building blocks. They don't see the 20 years it took to be able to draw in perspective from imagination. They don't see that stuff. They see the sexy marketing art, the big Assassin's Creed concept art. They see, you know, uh, matte paintings on Star Wars movies. And they're like, I want to do that, which is great. Whatever brings you into the rodeo, you know, welcome aboard. But you have to understand there are some insane amounts of hours of literally grinding out some of the most boring stuff you're ever going to do because you have to get used to it. You have to get used to the dexterity of it. You have to be able to draw the box. You have to be able to draw the line. You have to be able to understand what atmospheric perspective is and how to emulate that in a visual setting. There's a lot of things that go into this that nobody ever really sees. That's part of the reason why I like posting up some of my paintings and like some of my behind the scenes where I'm not necessarily too proud of the paintings. I think social media has it twisted the same way everybody looks like a supermodel and they have the happiest life in the world. You don't see what happens behind the scenes. With art, it's the same way. A lot of people, and maybe for good reason, maybe there's a reason why some of these artists that do time-lapse videos of genius-looking art have 400,000 subscribers and I can't break 10K. Maybe so. Maybe because whenever you see some of my stuff, you might be like, well, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> it doesn't. You're right. It totally doesn't look very good. But that's the point. You have to get through the bad paintings to get to the good ones. Does that make sense? You have to put in the time. It's that time under the gun. It's the, the, the dexterity of it. You, you just got to do it. No one's going to do it for you. I'll put it this way. If all it took to get in shape was to read a fitness magazine, we would all be fitness models. But at a certain point, you can't just read about it. You can know all of it in the magazines. Well, this protein and that water intake and creatine and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Unless you do it, what are you doing? You know, that at that point, learning about it is your hobby, not actually doing it. So like looking at art or like buying art books or buying concept art, or whatever. That could be the hobby. You could be an art collector. Or you can decide, okay, pedal to the metal. I need to learn how to do this. Now you're an artist. Now you're learning. You're self-improving. You're absorbing. You're looking at the world around you. You're, 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 you're saying something with how you interpret the world. But you have to do it. You have to do it. That's the only way this works. Can you move your ears? Uh, did you see a person who can? It's a fun gimmick I can do, but I've never seen anyone else that say they can. Here's the thing. I can do that. Watch. Watch this. I'm going to bring these down here. Now I can't see anything, but I can see a little bit of the silhouette. Okay. So I'm going to do it right here so you can kind of see back here. So basically, if I remember how to do this, it's like...
There you go. Hopefully that picked up on the camera. Um, basically, it's like moving your eyebrows, but instead of up and down, you're moving them back and forth. And then it takes like whatever. Yeah, it takes like whatever that muscle is back there and like moves it. At least that's how I do it. So I don't know. I can't like flop them around or something. That'd be crazy. If I could do that. Oh, man, that'd be my new YouTube. If I could do that. <laughs> like, what's the what's the opposite of OnlyFans? That's what, that's what that would be. <laughs> All right. Final question. We got number 12. Number 12 is here. I'm worried about how stable Critus funding is. And if you have any information, they're down to just four full-time developers. Is it enough to sustain the program? What if their funding fails completely? Do they have some other stable income source to maintain the software and other things? So, I don't know any of the back end stuff on Krita. I don't. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with Krita to write a book about Krita. Um, I'm a big fan of Krita. I love, love, love Krita. Krita is getting better and better and better. But the reason why, not only do they have their developers who are geniuses, the community is the reason why Krita has so much traction. So there is actually a Krita community, kind of a Krita artists forum. And you have people developing add-ons. You have people developing um, brushes, of course, tools, like settings to change the way canvases work and like implementing 3D and importing stuff. And like, since it's open source, there have been some incredible community modifications and like additions to the program. Um, so I will say the Krita is very much its community. So in order for Krita to really thrive, the community needs to show up. Um, the developers are knocking it out of the park. They are doing incredible work. I would say if you have the spare money, and this goes for everybody, no matter if you're a Mac artist, a Linux artist, a Windows artist, it doesn't matter. If you have a spare dollar, Go give it to the Krita Foundation. That's going to help make sure that something as good as Krita, one, can always improve. It gets better and bigger and better, and it's always great. But also, in my opinion, the more important part, and I talk about it in my book, the fact that it is free to download and it can be on your system is huge. It is a huge way for people to get into art and digital art with hardly any money down. You just have to have the device. And if you want to get a pen tablet, you can, but you don't even need that. You can use a mouse. The more people as part of digital art, the better, I think. And Krita is its mission statement is to bring the joy of digital art to as many people as humanly possible. And that is something to reward. That is something to celebrate, to cherish. So donating to the Krita Foundation, and I will have a link directly in the description below. If you have a dollar, um, whatever, you know, any, any little bit, any big bit, any bit helps. And yeah, I try my best whenever I do have extra funding to go give a tenor or so to, to Krita and the foundation. Um, I'm not on the forums as much as I need to be because um, there's some great work there. But I check in probably once a month just to kind of see what everybody's doing. Um, but yeah, Krita is a great community, amazing software. If you haven't tried Krita, I'm going to have another Krita uh, video fairly soon, probably in the next two months. And uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Really, really cool. Um, I love Krita, man. But that's it. Oh, thank you. Voidstead. For the incredible questions. Um, if you have questions for Ask Wes, leave them in the comments to this episode or hit me up on other social medias, you know, all that good stuff. I love to talk shop. I love to answer questions, even if it's something very specific, like if you send me a piece of artwork and say, hey, how can I correct this or what can I change? That's great. Um, if it's something like, hey, can you move your ears? Well, we've established that, yes, I can. So that one, mark off the list. I can't do other like weird thing. Like I can't put legs behind my head. I can't do that stuff. So um, it'll have to be what any bald, fat, white guy can do. <laughs> that'll be that'll be the requests, right? 
Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out. It's so much fun. I love doing these episodes. They're a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, uh, go make some cool art. Go get yourself download Krita. Work on your dexterity. Um, paint what you enjoy. I have a new video out about fan art. Is it good to put in your portfolio? So go check that video out if you haven't already. But until we meet again, go out there, make cool art. We will see you soon.